that we have a fabulous group of readers tonight and fabulous people coming up. Next week, this is an anomaly for City Art. Next week, we are not meeting. We usually do the first three Wednesdays, as you know. But next week at Westminster, Shira Dentz is reading with Amy Gersler. And so we're imploring you to go to that reading and then come back here on the 19th for Chris Lebo in Harmony Button and the 26th for Jesse Parent and Jean Howard. Uh, and a full list of readings for October. There are four in October, so come back for some of those. Michael Gills, uh, Miles Fuller, Linda Aldrich, Jackie Oshro, Peter Covino, Kathy Wagner, and Paisley Rechtal. Come on, it's good. Yeah. City art, we're, we're, we're thriving. Um, tonight, if you have a schedule, and I'll see if there's some more here, so if you didn't get one, I'll, I'll pass them out if there's some more in this pile. Um, we're going to go in the order that is here, and I did omit one reader who was voted in, and uh, we don't want to omit him. Uh, Mike White will read after me on this list, so we'll, uh, and you'll love that. Uh, so um, look for that, and then we'll just go in order, and if, uh, readers, when you come up, would you please say your name, and then wow us, okay? Uh, welcome again, and have some fun. Wind of all stripes, the summer's hot-held breath, 
a plane flying far above, many birds, errant thorn, the impulse to fruit, some brief and fleeting murmur, ghost, they are after all my trees, of a voice calling me to come, come away, come outside. This poem has some singing in it, and I'm just a little nervous about that, but I'm going to do my very, very best. <coughs> it's also an ode to um, my love of vulgar pop music. <laughs> How can I be sure? Long after stars have lost their glow, words, a tumble of pop songs unmooring them from their melodies, come at me in the story of how Elvis and Tom Jones met. Elvis shooting Paradise Hawaiian style, Tom to sing on a soundtrack backstage at Paramount. Elvis walked toward Tom singing, with these hands I will cling to you. I'm yours forever and a day. Both came from church singing plus something else. For Elvis, juke joints for Tom, the radio held close as he recovered at 13 from TB. Do you think I'd like Wales, Tom? Elvis asked him once. And Tom said he could imagine Elvis singing with the male choirs in the Rhonda Valley. It's a story that Jones likes to tell. It tethers him to a Vegas past when Elvis often sat in the audience, the rioting on stage, the story panties women threw at him, the relish he had for a show. Still, it must be true that Elvis walked toward him, singing. His song sung back to him, first verse of his very best story, the one he'd tell himself and everyone else for the rest of his life. All this week I'm hearing a song whose words have loosened from their melody, and it's not Elvis's voice in my ear, but Tom's. All I can hear is the bridge and a few stray phrases, but I hear them true, as sure as if the song were a standard, sung in a great rough baritone. What a chest he had, what a head, not to mention pipes, the whole instrument of which that torso and groin undulating must be understood to be a part. In the working men's clubs of Wales where he got his start, he sang ballad after ballad, what the men loved. The later self-making, shirt frilled open to their heavy medallion, tight pants, the frank to cartoonish sex. It was a self that wanted to and would sing forever to a Vegas crowd on television and to me right now, wordless and full bore, the voice lifting the bridge of this nameless song I cannot place that came to me without a reason, except to swear to my heart that he must have sung it. The arc of its melody soars surges and it becomes my motive. I can think of nothing else as I listen to song after song from the Tom Jones catalog. A time or two I come close. I sing it to anyone who will listen. Funny forgotten familiar feelings proposes my Scott son-in-law. And I come to admire the raw, flexible voice, to love his face and body, beautiful both in his youth and in the aged animal, now 70. When at last I find the unnamed song, it's the Young Rascals, another band entirely. I listened to it over and again. I remembered, so look around, though the actual words were, whenever I, the rhythm's the same. And the melody is just as I kept hearing it. When Elvis sang Tom Jones' own song to him, it promised persistence despite difficulty, promised that the singer would never, no never, let the hearer go. Just as my half-remembered song pressed me, though its singer confused death and loneliness, unsteadied when he and the hearer were apart. In a world that's constantly changing, how can I be sure? I see Tom Jones singing my song, walking toward someone, toward Elvis perhaps, toward me, I prefer the voice of handsome Tom, Vegas Tom, vodka martini one, two, three at hand, cigar between his teeth and the smile of a man who loved his life. I trust him with this song, Tom, who loves to chat, voluble Tom. How can I be sure? Of all those who have sung it, I like Tom's version best, though he never in fact recorded it. 
In his hands, I am sure, of every pop song made that visceral, sung in the voice of a man who never held back when he sang. My song he sings to all its corners, sings until it lifts my very rafters. I'm Kim Johnson. I will not be singing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a slow writer. I don't. I think that I have not read these poems in this venue. I tried to get things that had been that might be new anyway. <clears throat> Blanks. The sun rolls up like jackpot. The thousand blinding coins of it spilling across my windshield's dust dapple. Glory be, my lucky day, flush and prime as a fresh dime, as if the world been spit-shined. The asphalt ahead's gleamed to a high glare, and I play my pedal past the red line and faster. Must be what faith feels like, to drive believing in the persistence of highway lines whose white paints whiten to a wide white field to glimpse in swift periphery and guess you've passed a rest stop's spare oasis, to catch the flicker of a cactus shadow as a signpost toward some providential end. If on such a visionary road I should see the world's material scroll back to show whatever lies behind, who would blame me? Who'd blame if I sublimed each raw thing into a revelation? the big rig flipping its rock chip stick bada, the naga hide peeling an unction from my thigh. But no, faith's for the sucker whose luck's run out. Faith is for the fear that sometimes you get cherries and sometimes you pull the handle and it comes up blanks. This has a weird feedback thing going on, does it? Or is it just my hand? All right. Okay, the last line here has a big space, which I will indicate by some gesture. <laughs> None such. Not this, you the urge and I the page. Not this, you the harrow, blades sharp to turn the fallow field of me. Not the wheel that turning winds the carded wool of me. Not you the pick and I the Rickenbacker cherry neck with the humbucker pickups. Not you, the piston whose combusted thrust shoves the rod that drives my crankshaft. Not I, the vehicle. Not I, the sign, and you, the substance. You, the blessed body, absent and sublime, and I, your accident. Not though we both were nothing thereby. You are not my, I'm not your sign. <laughs> Do one more. <clears throat> This has a term that I did not know until my dancer sister taught it to me. It's port de bras and it's this. <laughs> Catapult. Knock back the catch on the spooled cord and let fly. Skyward, my blithe port de bras, and skyward flings anything you give me. Flaming hay bales, boulders, wet mounds of dung, groundling stuff which airborne turns unearthly beauty, unbodied grace for which the battlements too mean a target. See how shot that clatter of tacks glints like stars above the bonfires, how that vat of rendered fat anoints the fortress walls with burning. See how the corpses of the hostile dead hang angelic in the middle air, and how angelic they fall as if hungering for the earth and its sweet demolishings. Holy the fall, I hymn it with my arm. Thanks. I'm Sandy Anderson, and thanks, Joel, for keeping this going. The writing exercise gets out of hand. 
and the stars are birds bombing, the same letters whispering from well so deep. They come out the other side of Earth in a different language, and the natives chisel them in tablets, and whole cultures become a deja vu of flashbulbs still in our eyes after the photo's been snapped, and the stars go on listening in the same burned out glow of our dead, whom the exercise says to address in a new way that is meaningful, like the way the dinosaurs have evolved into robots in our museums, and the words dropped into wells make no resounding echoes. Baroque. The Scarlatti inverted itself, then spun back, and my fingers trilled in the midst of it, quails calling to each other from their bobbing heads until a sentry's trailed all clear and the babies came out from under the spruce and scattered over the lawn with little jumps like feathered, feathered, feathered fingers learning to fly. What's left of a fire? The aftermath of a heart eaten like a roasted chicken, the clouds in the sky that forgot to rain, my fingers sifting through the ashes, making of myself the urn. And I'll read two more, they're both elegies. This one's from Joe Kirk. Actually, they're both elegies for people who were involved in Word Affair, which was the nine-year predecessor of City Art. God plays dice with the universe, Joe Kirk. 1947 through 2007. Every day, an apple. He'd emerge from his cave of books and walk to the store, singing. Stride to the fruit aisle, answering the fluorescent lights, Conting Kant and Heideggering Ivan Yelich. All the way home, shining the apple against his black shirt, exercising doctors, Vietnamese jungles where his helicopter crashed into madness, where gravity became real. Cars honked like mortars when he paused in the middle of the street, watching the sky for planes. He shook his free fist at the cars and sky, his other hand still polishing apple words, bowing to the trees at the roadside to let him pass. And this is for Jeffrey Harris, who died two weeks ago. Now that you are ashes, it is useless to play with matches, but we all do. Your spine veined with words behind us. Lightning splashes, and the frog beneath the tree continues croaking. And it is your voice we hear. Thank you. nice to follow Sandy because I get to say good things about her. Uh, Sandy Anderson started this thing in 1989 and as you heard from what she said, she did other work nine years before that and, and she is really the reason that we're here and she started this thing and I just, you know, caught hold of the goat and keep on running with it. So thanks to Sandy. And <laughs> say it's a goat because it will eat anything. Um, <laughs> just that. Uh, I got a great postcard last summer from a poet friend of mine, and this was this what came out of it. the story of Manjursi Cave, 159. The flowers grown out of the body, the mire, carpet of leaves muddled to the pond bottom, cannot believe they rely on a star for their own light, but prepare their own, they know, pear light golden sweet, the waters green set glowing. One plays a flute resting his feet on the lotus. He feels his souls lifted by the flower and breathes over the flute from deep and through him. A petaled song from the heart of the flower, something green as apple candy and lime rind. 
The reed player blows wooden noise, high-pitched whine, the grass shrieks, torn by the lip pressure, the momentum of breath. No movement comes but from blossom root, swaying the dark bed below, still current of the water, drawing dark into the music dancers dance to, with smiles that break the barriers of smiles. The bells sway as they hit the other bells and ring inside like pleasure, hitting every nerve with light all the way to the bronze heart of its secret chapel. So it was a summer of weddings, many weddings. Uh, we've done four so far. I have five Friday. I will have done five, I think. Six by next week. That's a lot of weddings. One of them was for my <coughs> stepdaughter, Kirsten, and, and her betrothed, Michael. And I wrote this for them. Sagrada Familia Epithalamia, with the epigraph, my client is not in a hurry. Antonio Gotti. <laughs> yeah, it's a great one. They are building a church in the city you live. They have building, been building a church a long time, and angels begin their descent down brightly tiled spires against higher gravity. Empyrean, pulling themselves down the cypress tree with doves, alabaster, and white pelicans at the base, feeding their young. Other angels hold the wine bread, and angels climb the pulsing bolt of light, holy family seven stairs down. They know the story begins their presence among animals, wheat sheaves, sea turtles, water birds, tendrils of vines and woods, foxes, crocodiles, morning glories, thistles. These angels praise the sacred beyond you, but sing, there's no descent, say, with your hands in the water of the stream, you two play with the substance of heaven. Drink the sacred river, lit beginning of things with no beginning. You participate in all blossoms, bird chatter, blessing, fire, universal eddy, trembling the reeds of stars. The building of this church takes time, and time fills now with you too in the city of its building. No hurry beneath balustrades of iron ivy and windows like mouths of ancient caves, mosaic chimneys spinning the stone sky. You wait to speak his name as it should be spoken. He understands in the park glazed with lizards and stone trees leaning over the walkway. Nearby, scaffolds screen basilica columns, and the ghost of the architect strolls the choir, glowing with sounds of tools on stone, saws, drills. Hammers pound, chis uh, pound chisels, bring angels to you too. Now you see spires across the sea, farther than the architect dreams the way two see the moon the same time in different parts of the continent and hear hammers building into the new century where you see the same moon on the banks of the Genesee. You spin together today in all these colors glazed with love, lapis, jade, coral, embraced in architecture, spreading the globe. A church where there is singing today for you where the consequences of the world singing every angel-lit hallway beneath, every vault of night and winter, where you two sing, yes, once, bronze ringing in the amber time. very, very loosest sense. Uh, it's called love. You mean the world to me, meaning the only way to see you is from outer space. As you know, I have little aptitude for space travel. Like, like the monkey they launched into orbit, I tend to push buttons at random and eat too much people food. Where am I going with this thing? I know the dark is all around us, love. I'm out here waving to you, only to you, 
round and green and blue. And this is called a uh, mirror. A man weaving up the street as a salmon was reflecting. I don't know you. I don't know you. When he fell unobserved into a manhole. And half swimming, half crawling through the dark labyrinth of tunnels below the city, his eyes evolved to see what could scarcely be imagined. And when he resurfaced, the war in which he played a part had been renamed, and the people he met did double takes, and to one another said, look, it's a giant rat. In a costume, they added to their children, who by the time they turned around were no longer children. And this one's called Signs. Dogs, one after another, leap at back fences, run in circles, and bark without sound. Then a woman, hanging blue clothes on a line, pauses and lifts her top and shows her breasts to our train wishing past. My father and everyone is reading a newspaper, but I am too young to read a newspaper. What does it mean? What does any of it mean? A thing of beauty. I want my goldfish back. By goldfish, I mean childhood, when orange was all the rage. Davy ate his, alive, and changed schools after setting fire to enough things. <laughs> the way through the dark, what is it? With terrible secret words, I cheered Davy on, and he shone. Two quick ones. Uh, this one's called The Monster. There are no school children in this poem. They have all been eaten. <laughs> now we can hear ourselves think. <laughs> now we can say fuckface in traffic. <laughs> Bring on the breakables. Take down the cleaners from the top shelf. And when we declare on a, on a whim, no world shall exist beyond the poem. No one will be there to pipe up from the back seat. Why? How come? <laughs> the next generation of college students, we can be certain, will not be reading this. The monster has seen to that. And last one. Uh, my intestines. Oh, the dark insatiable. The python suave, beautiful body, rippling and tensing, even in repose. The coiled mastery and blind urge. Goodbye, slow rabbit. <laughs> fire, and then the blower twirls another knob of gold on his metal pontil, dipping the tip into a pot inlaid with spikes to make the burning globe twist in upon itself as the man breathes out and a thin neck bulges, wreathes into a spiral like a unicorn's horn, but we're bored, he's bored, blowing and blowing the same shape over. It takes no effort. He stares off through one of the factory windows as he does it. Beneath the sign, no flash, a red line drawn to the cartoon camera to indicate the work is private, dangerous. The man's tongs pinch out a chest, a neck, the crowd applauding each development, though it has seen the same thing around the corner. We know what will come next. The man reaches into the bright elastic to yank a fat neck forward, to pinch out hair, a shovel-shaped face, to pull out one thin, bent leg and then another, the glass itself now tinged with ash as the fire runs out of it, dimming to topaz, caramel. He splashes water on the irons to make them smoke. It must be dangerous, this material, or why else would we watch? The blower has a ball patch, earrings, scars. He dips his tongs once more into the figure and out come back legs, a tail. The neck twists, and now the little face has a mouth that's open, screaming. Transparent hooves tear into the air. 
the tail's curled filament starts to thread as the pontals pulled away. You want to say, like taffy, but don't. It is not sweet. Only a spark of heat and then the inevitable descending numbness. Someone laughs. Someone takes a photo. For a moment, the room fills with light behind which we hear the scissors dulling snap. Our senses return stretched thinner, finer. We can almost feel the shattering of the glass. And since Mike said fuck face, I can read this poem. <laughs> so this is one sonnet from a whole series of sonnets, a crown of sonnets I've written to Mae West. Um, every sonnet is either an anagram of her, one of her one-liners. Each, each sonnet begins with a one-liner that she has. Um, or every word within the poem has to be using the letters within the one-liner. So it's sort of a form within a form. And this one, and then you get to hear me do my Mae West impression. Confessional. The only good girl to ever make history was Betsy Ross. And she had a stitch up a flag to do it. Ooh. <laughs> What gal is safe from being slut, tether of lies that leash a pretty girl through life? Shamed in school by those who'd claimed we'd undone the captains of our football squads. Shunned, despised, how like dogs we learned to heal. How we cringed and whined. How we pissed ourselves pretending to be good. Oh, but to insist beneath the artificial rules, a realer artifice named I might thrive, one capable as may of jokes so bright they'd split the world to its brutal truth. It wasn't that we were vile. We weren't sluts enough. Reader, I should have taken that boy out back and fucked the life out of him. Forget it. I have another 40 years ago. I plan to be filthy. I plan to be low. Laugh, reader, so that I can last. I'm writing the story of a life. Listen, it's about a girl who lost her reputation and never missed it. Thank you. <laughs> Steve Tuttle. Uh, this, uh, these are a couple of excerpts from a story about a medieval king who is obsessed uh, with the guillotine, which he calls a single-use machinery, and uh, time travel. These are his obsessions. He is in love with a young woman, that young woman. He is slightly in love with her. She is not his wife. She is not the queen, or a queen, or one queen among many. He knows that the world is filled with queens and potential queens, and that this young woman is neither. But he also knows that queens are everywhere, just waiting to happen. He will not allow himself to think of the guillotine, how easily, how smoothly, how completely it does its work. The full, heavy, deliberate efficiency of that thing. He won't think of the guillotine. He isn't thinking of the guillotine. He will stop thinking of the guillotine any moment now, or now. <laughs> or now, or soon, eventually. He will force his thoughts elsewhere and will allow them to settle as they so easily, so willingly do on that young woman upon whom he has the slightest, most inappropriate, most unkingly crush. That woman who is fully clothed, head to foot, and yet seems strangely, unpredictably, illogically to be wearing nothing at all. It is her special privilege, he believes, to, ex to exist as a beautiful, chaste, fully clothed young woman and to somehow seem like something else. It is a modest immodesty, or an immodest modesty. He can't determine which. Which is to say that the beautiful, chaste, fully clothed young woman manages somehow to give the impression of being less than chaste and less than fully clothed, although never less than beautiful. It's a small trick she has, a sleight of hand, a clever duality. What is it, he wonders, about this woman that so draws his attention? And why is it, he wonders, that when she is here, cleaning out that chamber pot, shaking dust from this tapestry or that one, that his thoughts seem always to reduce to two? He thinks of her, he longs for her, he wants to be in some way closer to her than he is or imagined possible. And when he is not thinking that thought, he is thinking the other one, the one about his queenly wife and the perfect efficiency of single certain single-use machinery. Given the hypothetical option to travel through time, 
And given the hypothetical conditions that one must choose to travel, only forward or only backward, and that one must travel only once and not multiple times, the heavyset man decides that he would much prefer to travel forward in time. And given the choice, he would most likely opt for a jump of several centuries in time in his all-at-once adventure. His reasoning for this is simple. First, he knows that the future is more interesting than the past, given that the future contains what is already past and what is not yet past, but will be past before the future arrives. While the past contains only the past, and more importantly, an even smaller portion of the past than the one he currently has to work with. <laughs> Second, he knows that he knows a great many things, but he feels a deep skepticism about his own abilities when it comes to the question of transferable knowledge. He wonders, that is, what he could possibly offer to people in the past that, they would, that would be of any value to them, while he knows that what he knows would be of great value to people of the future who likely know much more than he knows, even though they remain figuratively in the dark. When it comes to knowing his mind regarding certain decisions he made, representing as he does not only himself, but all kings, rulers, monarchs of his historical moment. The people of the future will want to know, that is, why he made this decision or that one, why he invaded this kingdom or that one, why he beheaded this person or that one. Third, he suspects that a return trip from the future, assuming that such a return were part of the allowed, permitted, agreed upon conditions of time travel, would increase his abilities, powers, skills as a king. It would, at the very least, allow him to seem to future generations a man of even greater knowledge than he already is or seems. Given no choice, and given the obligation to travel backward in time or not at all, the heavyset man decides that he would likely travel only a brief distance in time, a brief time in time and that he would maybe only travel back a month or so, a week or so, a couple days or so. He imagines the things he might do, the plots he might undo, the schemes he might undermine if he were able to reverse time only briefly in such a limited way. Thank you. series called Postcards from London. This one's called Cromwell News. This postcard comes to you from Cromwell Road, where I spent the better part of an hour aimlessly turning the racks, which displayed photographs of Buckingham Palace, the London Eye, Big Ben, Parliament, Westminster Abbey, Kensington Palace, Prince Albert Hall, Victoria and Albert Museum, and the National Portrait Gallery. I coveted the overpriced water, fingered the coins in my pocket. I hovered to overhear the clerk's conversation. I wanted to ask, are you always kind or only to me? I wanted him to choose me from among the tourists as the most sympathetic, if not the most beautiful. Once, as I waited for the bus, he saw me outside and raised his eyebrows in greeting. Forgive me, for I fell in love with him over and over again. He smiled. He asked, how are you? He had an accent. I want him to forgive me my sins of coveting and envy. I envied his gaiety, his supposed approach to life that allowed him to enjoy this convenience store of cheap, breakable lives. I asked him, why do you smile? And he told me, I want to go back, but for now, the war is out there, not in here. We have to make our way as we can. He included me in his language, the we that the English constructed to exclude him, the royal we, but that, as we stood there, included the continent between us, spanned only by his breath. This one is called the British Museum. Collected in one place, the history of Britain's plunders, Elgin marbles, Egyptian mummies, Darwin's finches, and maps of unknown territories. Here, my skin qualifies as the cartographer's terra incognita. I pay two pounds for a cup of tea and cry quietly as I imagine the topography of your palm, rivulets, valleys, plains. When I see the Mayan skeleton encrusted with turquoise, I surrender wordlessly to the dreams of the dead. What we know of the past we ignore, and what we cannot ignore, what we cannot know, we invent. I call you from a payphone wedged beneath the stairs, and the crackle of air burns up all the oxygen between us. At such a distance, what can you know of the beauty of cold stone? Nothing. The British Library. Sylvia Plath, 
you could not know how the black ink would pierce my heart, for I am a mother too, or surely you would not have written such things. Now I understand the weight of motherhood and London and such longing as not even words can convey. You are here, nestled among Shakespeare's manuscripts, the Gutenberg Bible, codices of Eastern theology, and the Magna Carta. But you already knew there was nothing to believe in, not words or gods, and certainly not men. Sylvia, I picture you kneeling on the floor, your hair unkempt, your kitchen messy. And what I feel for you is not the sympathy of a sister, but the anger of a daughter. Oh, do it already. Put us out of our misery. But even that does not bring the rain to an end. And when we emerge with our parcels, the gray surrounds us as it must, even now, cover you. And one last one on loneliness. Nowhere is quite so lonely as rush hour on the tube. People smashed against me, I know not even one person's name, and I can't smooth someone else's hair out of my eyes or declare publicly that I am both peckish and knackered. Instead, I read, and when the train slams to a halt, a nearby man declares that if we are trapped, I will have to read the entire book aloud. <laughs> oh, London, your seven million inhabitants stride right past me, neither looking here nor there, except I will grant that one time I saw someone I recognized. But he was a tourist, too. Why do I tell you this? Because I am lonely, and you must listen. Thanks. I'm Shannon Dallin. This first poem I will read is a poem from my friend Brock, who got me back into skiing a couple of years ago. It's called Gift. Sunday, seven fresh inches of shimmering powder. In the chair, we lived through space, cloud, and glitter. The only sounds, the mild grind of cable hauling our small weight. The top becomes visible. Like the snow, our bodies tick with alacrity. From the lift, we rise, one sensuous motion, and glisten into the snow vibrating in the clean mystery of being alive. In my mind, I see your glide, your fluid wind. The evergreens breathe, snow whispers under our skis, and the whole world shines, ecstatic at our arrival. When we slide through snow, no one has ever touched. Glorious, you say, before turning to etch your elegant S into the mountain. And I follow, crossing and recrossing your path. So when we look back, we'll see delicate interlocking strings, a gray blue bracelet, infinity. <coughs> Red Riding Hood's grandmother dressing for bed. If I dress myself in darkness, if across my face I draw a black lace veil, if I sew for my granddaughter a dress, a white dress, with hyacinth and crocus embroidered across the bodice, if I fasten a strong satin ribbon to tie around her waist, if down the back I fix glistening pearl buttons, God, oh my God, Allow her to become another girl, one who will glide like an angel, past evil, past danger, arriving always at my gate. <clears throat> Red Riding Hood watches Wolf sleep. I lie down for I am your echo, our story cupped in the savage shade between us. We dream curled in cool grass like tender parentheses. Once we were subterranean, below all grasp of roots, sharp shovels. We lived as larva, pale as moonlight, as naked and faceless. But inside our blind tunnels, we brimmed with longing beat our wet wings till we burst onto earth, all its brutal nudity. 
Last night, you and I set sail in a hot air balloon as huge and yellow as the April sun. In our little basket, we drank champagne. For me, you sang. Dizzy in thinning air, rising higher and higher, we curved into one another till we became the gentle boil of bluebells in drowsy fields. Once, I loved a crab apple tree, blossoms so bright, so pink. Beneath this tree, I would lie down and sing. The flowers trembled like eyes filled with tears. This afternoon, lying in the fading ache of spring, of fragile blooms, I watch you dream. The sun slides low, throbbing with apology. Um, quick advertisement first. Um, as some of you probably already know from my relentless and harassing emails, um, the book festival, the Utah Humanities Book Festival, starts very soon. Um, actually, the opening salvo is next week in Orem with Timothy Egan, um, the wonderful journalist and historian. But most of the events take place in October, and uh, our website is just about complete. The schedule is just about done. The program comes out next week. So we've got a killer lineup this year. Um, Sherry, thanks to you, we have Joey Harjo coming in. Uh, we've got Raul Zarita, Anna Castillo, uh, David Quammen, uh, Craig Childs, and a lot of people that are in this room tonight. So just keep an eye on the website and keep an eye out for the program, and uh, please come out and support that. All right, some poems about fire. Uh, first one is about kind of the more conventional sense of fire. Subsidence. Earth tolerates, sometimes feebly, a wary smile forms beneath a tree. It is crusted in white, the frosting from a birthday cake that is harrowing and hollowing and burning like a trick candle. And you blow and blow, and no matter how hard you try, it was there before your birth. And what started as a poem of place is now a hole eight feet deep. And big around is you, but not a place, not here, where the only sign of you is a moan through the steam, misguided Persephone. So close to gone now, a region of sacrifice giving way. And like that old centurion, when a wound presents itself, you poke and prod and put your ear to it to hear the sea and whoosh. And I started a manuscript six months ago, dealing with the Nevada nuclear test site, um, kind of in anticipation of a visit I was going to be paying to the site, and I made that visit last week, and it was probably the most surreal and beautiful and harrowing eight hours of my life, and uh, I really love that quote that you, you mentioned from Gaudi, that my client is in no hurry, because these are men whose client was in a big hurry, and the, the uh, Consequences of that are play out in, in no more visceral way than, than not that side. So uh, this is from, or these uh, next few poems are from that manuscript. July 16th, 1945, at the gate. Curvature of the earth, edge of a great drain, what falls from skies subsides unnoticed, unbeknownst to the sea, or anything but animal quiet awaiting. Migration to bubble up elsewhere, a seeping wound, a trail's lead like staff, or something worse. The ground knows its way, cracks it geometrically, dismisses itself as barren, as waste. This too gives way. Already small structures on the crust surveil a sweep of the eyes, headlights on the ridge. Nothing is far enough off, even the distant tremor, shiver of a ranch, slight twist of barbed wire in the early morning, an animal that just clears the knots or a hunter frees his sleeves, knowing somewhere in the dark it must lay down to plead out. He motions his companion, silence rebounds, range upon range, diluted but close enough to sound his hand's mouth, now I am become. Poison the wells. 
Do not let them tell you there is no water here. A great aquifer in the base of the skull sloshes as we go through the motions. Chickens and eggs, chickens and eggs are useless. Fear is the first into that pool, and then we get creative. Take a land of nothing, we have plenty. Build a dam in one to power great lakes of electrolysis in another. Send divorced elements by the time to build homes for lonely pilots who can cross a sea. Keep your head straight or the weight of the tide will bowl you over. Elsewhere, whole storms and seasons are diverted to cool what is buried. The pipelines form a crude frontal lobe. The head, the original cooling tower, watch those sutures closely. On days it rains, there will be no tests, but imagine all the steam. Rubicon. The photographs of Edward Moybridge proved that when a horse runs, there are brief intervals in which not one of its legs touches the ground. In essence, the horse is flying. Zeno tells us that the horse will never again touch the ground as it must first go halfway to the ground, then halfway through the second half, and half again of that on into an endless trajectory from which the horse will never again rise. Duchamp was likewise optimistic. The nude pauses on the last stair, gaping into the darkened dining room, her place at the table long since removed. We, of course, have perfected this process. Once footing, the feel of things is no longer necessary. Impact is merely implied. In its place, a putting of glass. The closest thing to touch is a doppelganger of sky. Vault. Intestinal fortitude is sculpted from bent rebar, steel and concrete 30 inches thick. Drop a bank vault in the desert, preposition cave, a relation or measurement belt cinched tight around the gut. Warnings of abandoned refrigerators were everywhere. They were children, the doors nearly off its hinges, desire tastiest in the shade. No deposit, no return, a running joke with a drive up window blown clean out and melted down. We are ransomed for a box. A hiding place in the space so vast its skin cracks in mile-long increments. How many kids climb inside that dark and wait for the seeking to start? Somewhere in the back of the teller line, one says, Gentlemen, time to decide just what you have the stomach for. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rachel Marston. Um, this is from a new novel project I started last year. At first, time spooled out so very slowly. Your days had long been shaped by small increments of minutes and a series of checklists once written down but then committed to memory of how to keep everyone safe. That first morning, after you dropped Ben at school, you returned to the house. You walked to the garage and pulled out the drill and the hammer. Before you removed the second door to X's room, you stood with it closed and peered through the glass. You rarely had to clean it. You had somehow imagined when you first installed the door that it would be covered with X's handprints, tiny, sweaty pleas for freedom, marking your failure as a mother. Instead, it was as if the door had made him safe too. He never registered those emotions, but still you ascribed them to him as if he was relieved to not be hurting anyone, though the psychologist told you over and over and over that he doesn't think or feel the same way as most of us, right and wrong don't register with him. Even now, 14 years later, with all the things you'd seen in your home and in the, institu in the institution, there, you said it, with its ivy-covered brick facade and sprawling lawns and art facilities, that's still what it was. You clung to this idea that inside X somewhere was a more human piece, a part of him that actually felt sorry. You shake your head. You don't want to think of those days. And you should get back to work. You're composing a piece of music and you've been struggling with the clarinet solo for days. Usually the music comes to you almost whole. What you imagine a visionary experience would feel like if you believed in them. You hear the music and you see the notes in your mind the rustle of the clarinet, the melancholy stirrings of the cello, even perhaps a little dulcimer. You took up composing again after you gave X away. There it is, another euphemism, all these ways of not blaming yourself. You can't blame yourself. 
said your mother, your therapist, Jeremy, but you did it. You and Jeremy, signing the papers, sending the checks every month. That's what Jeremy continues to resent, your defective son, who continues to be a burden to you, who can't simply be erased from your lives because, if nothing else, there it is, a monthly bill for $3,000. You pause again. The scars on your hand are faint now, a tiny murmur, barely visible white lines. Some of X's scars had faded, but one on his left forearm healed in a strange way, leaving a raised pink welt. But where he lived now, the places he'd lived since he was seven, such scars were not strange. A guy on his floor, Stephen, had a red jagged one running from just below his left ear across the front of his neck. You never asked X what had happened to Stephen, worried that talking about violent things would make him more violent. Once, a year after you sent X away, you hit a rabbit on the head with a shovel, right between the silky ears because you wanted to hear the sound of the heavy metal head against the fur and bone. When you tell the story, the rabbit was foaming at the mouth and you didn't have time to think and you'd been digging the new garden bed to prepare it for planting greens and one, two, three, you hit it and then you buried it and it was done. You are some sort of heroine, protector of your other son and husband, capable of keeping the home the way it should be, uninvaded by rabid, rabbit forces. The truth is that the rabbit wasn't foaming. It was a small, tender, wild hare who had strayed further from its den than it had before. The rabbit was, as rabbits will do, investigating the garden. And you had an urge to kill it, to smash its little head with your $12 shovel just to see. And in this moment, you could better imagine what it was like to be your son than you had before or since. And in the moment after, the crack of the skull more delicate than you can imagine, the lack of smell, the deep darkness of the blood, the stickiness of the brains. You began to sob for what you had done and you threw up behind the overgrown mint plant. That was, that was what also what was different, what would always be different between you and your son, your remorse. You dug a hole at least three feet deep Though the rabbit was small, so small, and moved its body with the very shovel that had taken its life. You wiped the shovel clean on the dirt and again on the grass, and finally with 10 minutes of water and heavy pressure from the hose. You covered the body with dirt you dug for building the beds. You covered the dirt with a bit of grass. And when you moved away from that horrible house, you no longer had to look out the kitchen window to be reminded of what you'd done. Thank you. great opportunity to read with everyone. Up until a minute ago, I felt uh, really comfortable because Kim Johnson's sons were in the back uh, reading the big book of whales. And I'm used to being ignored at home. It made me feel really at home. <laughs> but they've left, so I'm nervous. Uh, this summer, uh, I've been writing either longish prose poems or very short nonfiction. Brian Evanson calls these pieces of uncertain parentage uh, double agents. So uh, I'll read one of those to you. Um, it's about Pablo Casals, the great cellist uh, from Spain. I guess you'd call him the 20th century yo-yo ma. Um, so most, of pe most people know that he was a great performer and composer, but he was also a kind of uh, activist as well. And he um, went on periodic music fasts refused to play, um, and he also refused to visit certain countries, including Spain for a time, which was his home country, and the United States. So he made an exception for the Kennedys who invited him to the White House, but otherwise he didn't visit the United States, didn't like their politics. So this is a poem titled, uh, oh, I might insert this, ran into an aphorism the other day, which he would probably like. I, think, I can't remember who wrote it, but he said, um, politicians are not born, they are excreted. <laughs> Okay, so this poem is titled, I Am Thinking of Pablo Casals. Not as a boy, his first cello a gourd, and not as a cellist, Phnom, sawing away at the world, but Casals as an old man in exile. He has taken up residence just over the French border in the Pyrenees, 
and vowed a vow. Never again will I set foot on Spanish soil as long as Franco lives. But now the dilemma. En route to an international concert, he must change planes in Barcelona. To return to Spain would be to condone a fascist state of torture and mayhem and lend legitimacy to a despot who murders his citizens and once firebombed Guernica into dust, then blamed the Basques. Then brilliance strikes. Why not pass through the airport without setting foot in it? A verbal quibble, yes, a linguistic wobble, but one that would shame Franco. I'm thinking of Pablo Casals. Bald-headed with wire-rimmed glasses, he looks something like Gandhi, but earthier. If you need a soundtrack to complete the airport scene, cue up box six suites for unaccompanied cello. Their mournful seaside like incoming waves. Casals debuted them in his 20s after practicing them two hours a day for 12 years. In Barcelona, he could have requested a wheelchair, along with a sturdy steward to push it. He could have glided the lobby, his feet mere inches above Spanish soil, dividing crowds the way Moses parted the Red Sea. But there was no wheelchair. Necessity forced Casals to be carried. For high drama, let's give him four burly attendants, all Catalonian, one on each limb. No chance to tour the city he loved, to ramble Las Ramblas, or salute the 12 sacred geese guarding the cathedral, or take in the delicious drips of Gaudi's architecture. He cannot even grab a cafecito at a kiosk, or amble into the men's room. No, he has to be carried. I'm thinking of Pablo Casals, a prisoner to his own integrity, but free, free, free. Casals, who at age 80 will stun the world by taking up with his 20-year-old student, Marta. His physician will warn him off such nonsense, saying, it might prove fatal. But Casals will ignore all critics and marry her for love, conceding, well, if she dies, she dies. <laughs> This is the cellist I picture lofted in the air, swooping past astonished gawkers, a smiling piece of luggage. Maybe a pant leg rides up. Maybe arthritis spikes through his left shoulder. Certainly, Casals is looking around. He waves, this friend of rosin and horsehair, the box suite swirling around him, floor play to some greater mystery, his eyes closing for a moment, as ours should so we can begin to hear. Thank you. I'm Natasha Saye, and I hope you'll forgive me for coming with my cold, but I love this event, and I love city art. And next Wednesday, Shira Dents and Amy Gerser will be reading in our business school auditorium, so come to that, please. I'm just going to read two love poems. This one's Q for questions. Why do sh salt and sugar combine in my mouth when I think of kissing you? Are the flight paths of birds unseen wires crossing the sky. How do I move under you, over you, next to you, seeking the trine and square and circle of union? With what kind of eyes, through which windows, did I watch you these years? And then, over what threshold did I enter the hollow in your spine to rest there? When did your chin become a ridge that I cling to? Why do I wish together yolks and whites to make the color of butter? Can you see the threat papered into the poppies we so admire? Seared and scarred this skin of mine, whose fiery ghost? What are the habits of happiness? 
Is one of them my hand on an anthill, absorbing the lemon scent of industry? Another, one of my fingers pressing like a knife in the center of your palm. How can our souls be animated by coal and ash, by burnt remainders? Do I have another charge on earth? Who else sees these pine limbs downed by lightning, branches quaking in thunder, needles thick on the forest floor? What was he thinking, he who cut the last tree on Easter Island make an altar? Why does your throat utter mock orange, become an apricot highly perishable? Can this last longer than my own unfaithful memory? Where was I in your time of peril, my heart an elephant in your darkness, partly murderous, a space unlit and cold, so cold. How is it that we talk using the sound of wings through the through blue air? How did this catechism become first light entering our room, counting backwards from infinity? And one more poem. This is called Vivarium and in its named after that museum in Seattle, which uh, is a down log from the Northwest Forest, um, and it's in a glass cover, and um, you can visit it for free and learn about the life forms of the down log. So Vivarium, a tree's life does not end once it falls to the forest floor. Another life begins in the nurse log, when insects hone in with stress chemicals, leaf litter, humus. Any place we are is alive with our breath, as in this antidote to mausoleum, mortuary, nihilarium. The sturdy western hemlock felled by snow teems again with ferns, spores, and microbes. The circle renewed, as when I imagine you ineluctably vivid, a seeing I render as faithfully as I can, in the same way that I've rendered fat from a goose and my life through the lens of solipsism. Looking into the pool of memory, I see love's avidity multiplied by us together. Laboratory come sculpture, our bodies encased in time, we need oxygen, water, green things, our exhalations absorbed by other spirits living in our enclosure, voices buried by the luxurious feel of moss as I remember the next passing sadness, air condensed into droplets on glass. Thank you. Our uh, Westminster's poetry brochures are in the mail, but if you're not on our mailing list or know someone who would like one, please take one. Hi, I'm Jennifer Tong. I'm going to read a piece from a cycle of prose poems that I've been working on for a while. It's called Hermaeon. And, um, of it, I guess, is that the speaker is dating the god Hermes, and that's sort of going variably. As is, in fact, the cycle itself. The prose poem is listing ever more toward the simply prose prose, so this could end up being fiction, not only uncertain parentage, but uncertain development. And I'm going to try keeping my sandals on, but that might not work. Um, the god Hermes kills the eyes with his beauty. You look and look and can't get enough of him, like a piece of candy on a little tray in a window reflecting the worshipful gaze of the little child who wants the candy he teases and tempts you with his beauty. You lick him all over. If you had a hundred eyes, a thousand, you couldn't see enough of him. A thousand times the delight you feel now gazing at him across the table in the beehive tea room. 
They're spooning sugar into your tea, measuring carefully to make sure it's not too much, and he's watching with his quiet, considering smile. How many, you ask, not bothering to elaborate, and he answers, not bothering to pretend. There's really no set, I should, I should say, that it's been previously discovered that, by the speaker that as she has long suspected, Hermes can hear her thoughts, he knows what she's thinking, sorry. How many, you ask, not bothering to elaborate, and he answers, not bothering to pretend. There's really no set number, it varies by version. I know, you say, but yours is the one I'm interested in. I want to know how many there really were. The truth, he asks in a tone of gentle mockery, his brows lifting. You nod. The truth, you say. There is no truth, he says. I'm the fabrication. You look at him for a long time. You're a pretty good one, you reply finally. A good story, he asks, still smiling his little smile. You're an excellent holograph, you answer, or hallucination, or figment. Am I hallucinating? I think figment comes closest, he responds. Just like that, you stop asking. There is something you're not ready to know yet. About this Argiofontes, you say instead. I am Argiofontes, he interrupts. You mean about this Argus? Yes, you nod again. About this Argus. Suddenly you stop again. You remember for the first time in many years that the first place you got glasses when you were 11 years old was named Argus Optical. Argus Oracle, you think, absurdly. Your optician was not the real Argus, he says dryly. I know, you respond, not really paying attention. The little oracles tucked along the way. Your optician went by tuck, by the way, you think. By the way you're stirring your tea, I'd say you're ruminating, he says. Now he is teasing you, toying with you. Is this how you played with Argus, you ask suddenly. He's startled. You spoke the words almost before you thought them and caught him off guard. For a moment he's nonplussed, and you realize it's been a long time since you've surprised him, or since he's acted like you've surprised him. You're sure now that this is the first time you have. Did you dance and dart, you ask, and taunt and goad? You see him, a hundred or a thousand of him, dancing maliciously in each eye, his sword and shield moving in unison. Like a little go-go boy, you say, admiring his choreographed precision, his little skirt swinging as he thrusts and faints, each eye going out like a lamp as he lances it. You're mixing your metaphors, dear, he says coolly, or at least your weaponry. And I didn't blind him. I beheaded him. You stop. The swarm of dancing fairies that you've conjured are extinguished. He isn't smiling. He looks at you without warmth. Will you behead me someday, you ask? You see yourself as Argus? I see myself as a gnat you'll swipe away. Argus was much more than a gnat, he says. You shake your head. You know what I mean. You know what I see. Yes, he says. A long moment passes. You gave his eyes to the peacock's tail, you say, not sure why you're bothering to talk. You need to talk, he says. It helps you think. Yes, you say. Hera did that, he says, not me. You lulled him to sleep. Yes, with your lyre, no, the pipes. Are you a fabrication? Your head feels heavy. You start to nod. If you were to nod off, you'd wait to find him gone and yourself alone, tea being poured at the next table, a sound as of water and willows. I'm Jackie Oshiro. I'm going to read two sonnets. The first one is called Late December. Who knows why these few bronze hangers on keep clinging to this otherwise bare tree? All the other leaves came down easily, an early blizzard chased by heavy rain. Weeks ago, were raked, cleared away. It's just these wizard, withered few that stay, autumn's keepsakes on my dim walk home. And my father, who left to his own devices, would put his underwear on over his trousers if he put it on at all. What makes him alternately listless, angry, scared, so willing to be wheeled off to therapy? 
where they say he looks at them so eagerly, greedy for instructions, tries so hard. And the second of these, I actually think I read a version of in this very venue, uh, and I have been trying to get it right, and I delude myself uh, that maybe I have, you can disabuse me of that after you've heard it. And um, my favorite uh, Petrarch sonnet is 146, and that's the sonnet where he admits that it just isn't gonna work for him to write in Latin, and he's just gonna have to write in Italian. It's very beautiful, uh, and I thought it would be interesting to write a sort of Yiddish version. Uh, you all know what Yiddish is? Do I have to? I don't. <laughs> Though I do have to tell you, Yiddish has terrific curses. You know anything about Yiddish curses? There's something like, um, may you have a house with a thousand rooms, and in each room there should be an enormous bed with a goose feather mattress and a fabulous pillow. And may you every night go from room to room and bed to bed and toss from side to side with stomach trouble. <laughs> and um, may I recommend to you my favorite new website, which is Yiddish Curses for Jewish Republicans. And uh, I'll give you the only example that I remember word for word, though it's not the best of them. And it does have the word shtup, which is a word that um, would translate a word Paisley used in her poems. And I, anyway, that Yiddish curse is something like, may the secretary your husband is shtuping depend on planned parenthood for her birth control and there are others it's really really funny you should go anyway so another word that i'm sure you know kaddish uh, in american poetry but it's a prayer praising god that you say uh in honor or memory of the dead so anyway this starts with my translation of the last six lines of the petrarch uh, maybe in a hundred years I'll get the first eight lines too, and then it's my son. So Petrarch's 146 Yiddish version. Your name, if my rhymes were understood that far away, would fill Bactria and Thule, Atlas, Olympus, Calpe, the Don, the Nile. But since I can't reach all four corners of the world, that lovely country will hear it that the Apennine divides and the sea and Alps define. That's the end of 146. So, and in what scrap of earth will they hear my song? Listen to my song. Which hills or seas will take in all that shamelessness, that yearning? And don't think by song that I mean this. There's one, I barely understand a word, lodged between my throat and my esophagus, puffed up with endearments rarely offered without some unsolicited advice, its syllables, needles squabbling with thread. The very ones that once sent me to bed or told me I looked like my father's troubles. They left off as they left off scrounging rubles, each curse a fresh disease, too fake or rash, to eke out Kaddish for their scattered ash. Hi, I'm Star. Thanks for being here tonight. There are books back there on the table. The Poetry at Three have me and Shannon and other poets in our poetry group. They're $3 each or two for five, pay me. Or for Shannon's red writing her papers, I think that's 17, pay her. I'm going to read just three of the sleazy lounge poems from 70s Logan, Utah, relayed to me by Mitch the Muse. <laughs> oh, it's screaming at me. I hate it. it. What if I bring it back here a little farther? Will that help? So that it doesn't scream? Is that better? Okay. Don's Barber Shop, 1967. All the junior high boys got their cuts at Don's. Every two weeks, they'd walk uptown to the west center entrance of the Del Mar Lounge and Supper Club, turn right, and take a seat in Don's open 
shop to wait with the town's businessmen where everyone got a non-Beatles cut, short, high over the ears, and squared off at the neck. Dawn's hair was thick with natural curl parted on one side, white as snow by the time he was 50. His barber chair was classic black and white like a police car, with ornate scroll work in the metal side panels and tilted footrest. Working men wandered through the shop to buy beer on tap and bring one back for Dawn, who always had a cold one on the counter next to the antiseptic. He'd laugh with the customers, comb and scissors, flashing. Everyone smoked. Even the boys, air thick and gray, all the way back to the dining room, where families came on weekends to dine on steak and deep fried jumbo shrimp, the Del Mar class act for all the non-Mormons in town, with a few part-timers and jacks thrown in. The boys often said they couldn't wait till they were old enough to buy a beer for dawn, but when they turned 16, they got jobs and cars and girlfriends and quit getting haircuts altogether. Eventually, a group of lawyers bought the building, closed the shop. Don took his chair home to the garage. Last we heard, he was cutting ward members' hair in his driveway on Saturdays, minus the beer. <laughs> Del Mar Lounge, members only, 1969. You could go in if you didn't belong dance, have dinner with your family, even get a drink if you found a sponsor. At the Del Mar, all the liquor was kept in a locker behind the bar, bottles purchased in advance by customers, each bottle tagged with a name, so members paid a setup fee to drink from their own personal <coughs> stash. If you were a waitress just around the corner, you could serve the 2 a.m. Del Mar crowd at the Mount Logan Cafe and Polynesian Room. Your husband might be babysitting, drunk in front of the television, the baby in a dirty diaper pulling the curtains down. He may have danced with you at the Del Mar on your night off work because you begged, but he wouldn't sneak you any of his alcohol. On New Year's Eve, he took you to the Cactus Club, you, underage, and danced with every woman in the place. And now I have to apologize to Lance because the last time I read this one, he said, oh, star. Cactus Club, afternoon shift. Now this is my last poem, and it's short. Coyote Carol had nipples too big for the pasties, brown aureoles, <laughs> bordering bright silver centers. Cece's G-string had been known to slip, furred V tucked thick with bills, lap dances forbidden when plain clothes cops came in for their weekly bust. They left empty-handed, pants pockets bulging. Carol was buxom, a tall, dark beauty with just the right shimmy. Even the women stuffed money under her glittering belt. Cece's tits were so firm and upright they could hold a cowboy hat while she danced, jiggling out front like a side-saddled filly. And could she ever skin that dance pole all the way up and down? Eyewitness account. When Coyote Carol got done dancing, it looked like the pole had a new coat of varnish. Hard to believe where she is these days. Relief Society president in the 17th Ward, Latter-day Saint with a past. <laughs> any one of you, yeah. much less all of you. Um, thank you, Joel, very much. Um, I've been feeling, just because of a little shift in the temperatures at night, the changing of the season, so I'm going to read two poems. One is an early summer poem, one is a September poem, and I think you will all recognize that it's not this summer that I'm talking about, it's actually last summer in these poems. Um, there's a, in the first poem, in the middle of it, there's an event that I think most of you will recognize that it happened in the news. And for those of you who weren't here last summer, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. This is called Some Other Summer. It's in three short sections. Some Other Summer. 
Last night while he slept, his brain rummaged its bag of tricks and produced a flood, a traffic snarl, some place he had to get beyond, though now he can't say what. Once he was the one packing, I the one thinking I had things to see. Wherever he was, always, he wished himself home. He would sleep in his own bed every night if he could. Two. All spring and into our longest days, snow kept piling up in the mountains, looming over the valley like a mine's weight. Now, relieved of its body, water rushes down the canyons, flooding creekside houses, soaking the fields until they reflect the sky, unplantable. We can't believe it's mid-July, and still there's more snow up there, deep and blue and breathing out cold far below the glaciers and snowfields that persist all summer. Last night, while he was dreaming, a sinkhole opened 40 feet wide in the sodden earth and 40 deep right under the highway. A girl, 15, lost to it. Her father at the wheel, speeding to get home when everything fell away. In darkness, on either side, the lucky ones stopped and waited, then turned back. Three. Meanwhile, already, the nights lengthen. Isn't this always happening? Crickets pipe up, pipe up, invisible among the leaves, waxing as they will into song with the waxing moon. Have you noticed? By August, they will be overflowing the night. In the dark that carries us, in the dark we all carry inside, the future waits. Meanwhile, it keeps on coming. Self-portrait with nightfall. Say you were born with a congenital absence, one you can see, a space you should have a digit or a limb to flutter and wave at the world, hang out in the air. Or you're missing something invisible, a chemical in the brain that tells you, smile now, a piece of gristle your heart needs to beat in synchrony. Mutter all you want. In this, you are different from nobody. Even in your feeling alone at night, when darkness brings itself down and all you find gazing out from where you are is light blazing the house across the way, where you imagine neighbors you haven't met baking potatoes or settling down in front of the TV looking to fill another long vacancy. You know that light catching the grass almost as far as the sidewalk will never reach you. See? Out back, across the ravine, a campfire burns at eye level, suspended. Have you forgotten where the ground is? Before the flames flicker shadows with nowhere else to go. September, nights begin shivering, the first breath from the north. Where will those ghosts sleep when the snow flies? And you, where will you be when the field has already erased itself.